Welcome to another Lung Talk, right, from the HRN or the HRN show. Um, actually, that sounds like a good name, Lung Talk. Lung Talk Show. What do you guys think? Lung Talk Show? <laughs> Anyways, uh, I'm your host, Alex Grichuin. Uh, uh I'm the director for Advanced Lung and Heart Disease with an HRN where, where I do pulmonary rehabilitation, and that's my specialty. Um, on this, uh, on our uh, live stream, for those that do not know, you have the option of asking questions to yours truly about anything and anything that, as it relates to lung health or even uh, overall health in itself. And um, in the live, in our, uh, in our Facebook Live and YouTube or our show, uh, we give people the opportunity to talk with an actual licensed clinicians like like I'm a respiratory therapist by trade. My license is under the Maryland Board of Physicians as a uh, respiratory care practitioner. And uh, my license is valid. So you can ask me questions as long as they're uh, relevant questions to the topics or relevant to me. So if you ask me what type of oil should I change in my car, I probably won't give you the right answer. But most likely I won't even answer it. Or say, I don't know, <laughs> rather, you know. So anyways, so if you want to write in the comment section, please go right ahead. And uh, you can just do a quick shout out and say hi. But uh, if you want to do a, um, um, if you want to ask any types of questions, please write in the comment section. I'll be happy to address those. Uh, please keep in mind that our uh, pulmonary, what we do here is specifically cardiac and pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, we even have a subgroup together where it's cardiopulmonary rehabilitation. Um, one doctor asked me, uh, one doctor asked me, why in your cardiac program, why in the world in your cardiac program, good morning, uh, do you also implement some of the pulmonary stuff into cardiac? Like, for instance, respiratory muscle training. Uh, incentive spirometry, okay? And we will implement sometimes those depending on people's necessities and their needs. Uh, so in our cardiac program, even though it's specifically for the heart and somebody doesn't have lung issues, I think it's a great idea just to double check and see if the heart's compromised at all by the effects of the environment, the lungs, and we're just going to check that. I think if you cross, you know, if you cross all T's and dot every I, you're, you're going to complete the sentence and grammar and everything's going to look good. So in our cardiac program, one of the cardiologists mentioned, why do you, in, our, in your cardiac program, why do you also, on some people, not everybody, but why do you also implement respiratory things? And, uh, you know, like respiratory muscle training, intercostal diaphragmatic muscle strengthening. Well, well, the, the good answer, the correct answer, would be most people with a heart problem, sometimes, not all the time, sometimes it was their lung that caused it. Their lungs, it was the environment, it was smoking cigarettes nonstop. So even though we're doing the cardiac, what's wrong with us checking to see if the lungs are compromised at all? And if they're not, then that person's clear from that. So... We have a lot of COPD patients, right? We have a lot of people that have lung disease in our pulmonary rehab program. A lot of them trans, uh, uh, go from pulmonary rehab to cardiac rehab, okay? That's because some, a lot of people, and this is common, a lot of people with lung issues also have heart issues because those kind of work side by side with each other, you know? So if you have, it, like I said, if you have any topics or anything you'd like to address, please write in the comment section. I'll be happy to address those as we go along. Our topics for today is we're going to talk a little a bit about, uh, let's see, uh, new types of respiratory illnesses. We're also going to talk a little bit about viruses and, and bacteria, okay? And some of these things are very easy to understand. Uh, in as far as questions goes, anybody can ask me any types of questions you would like. It doesn't have to be addressed specifically for um, pulmonary, even though that's really what you want to mention. You know, you want to uh, bring up 
topics that are pulmonary related, but let's say you have a dietary, uh, you know, a dietary thing, you know, dietary disease or maybe a dietary problem, and you wouldn't, you would like to get us some answers. I, I don't see anything wrong with asking questions. Okay, that's how we get more educated: is asking questions. There was a, a topic, not last week, but there was a topic. Uh, actually, I would probably say it's been a few months. Yeah, I would say it's been about a few months. And the the topic was um, a doctor referring their patients into a pulmonary rehab program. That was uh, basically the topic. And all that, all we were trying to find out is from, you know, when we were doing our research before we relayed the information, is a lot of doctors, when we ask, all right, we have a lot, okay, for, we have a lot of doctors. We have a lot of doctors. We have a lot of doctors refer to us. We have a lot of doctors, okay? But some of the doctors refer to us religiously, uh, while the others refer to them just to give a second option to their patient which is fine. But when I asked one of the doctors that, you know, that refers a patient in, why would you choose HRN, a virtual program, over any other? And um, a lot of them said it was the convenience, it was the, uh, the acceptance of uh, nearly every insurance. Um, not every single one, but uh, every, nearly every single insurance. Medicaid, we, I guess we, we sometimes have issues with Medicaid, but, um, but that's not anything to do with us. We, we don't write the insurance laws. You know, we, we, don't, we don't write those things. You know, we just, uh, whatever patient and their insurance, as long as their insurance is a, a decent insurance, most likely they'll accept pulmonary rehab. We don't know any other place that doesn't do that. But anyways, I mentioned to the doctor, what about the results? Well, the results are great. But that's not the main reason. And, uh, you know, I was kind of a little baffled by that because you're talking about people that, that can't breathe very well, their lung functions are very poor, and, uh, you know, all, this, all these complications and, uh, you know, their limitations are, are very, very limited on what they can do day in, day out. But, the, the, you know, when you have somebody who has very advanced lung disease, Lung functions are around the 30 percentile, you know, maybe even less. And we bring that up by more than 15, 20, 35 percent above what they are at. I don't know how that's not fantastic. I mean, why isn't that fantastic? And, uh, but some doctors, you know, choose us because of the convenience and not necessarily just because of the results. If you look at any pulmonary rehab program in the United States, and even if you've been to a pulmonary rehab any, uh, you know, any place in the United States, which is great, but th the national standards isn't applicable to every single pulmonary rehab program. What I'm trying to say is you go into a pulmonary rehab in a facility, you know, which is a traditional not a, uh, you know, it's uh, like we're a pulmonary rehab, we're a certified program, you know. But let's say you went to a traditional facility. What are the national, what are the, let's say I go to that facility and I ask them, uh, what are your success rates? What are the chances of me coming off oxygen, walking at least 10 times what I currently can do, okay? Say I'm only able to walk 10 feet, I want to get to 200 feet, you know, or something like that. You know, what are the chances of me increasing my lung functions, coming off oxygen, walking at least maybe even a mile before stopping, and, you know, maybe even uh, going back to work if I wanted to? And these are questions I would go into a facility and ask, or what a lot of patients should be asking these types of questions. But the results I usually get, sorry. Something just got touched. It was my fault. My bad, my bad, my bad. Okay. Sorry about that. So the result, I would think, would be better than just the convenience aspect of it. You know, just the convenience. And I don't think 
you know, convenience is great. You know, we are very convenient. You can do it at home. Uh, in fact, 99.9% .9 of all of our patients do it from home. You know, we do have a facility in here where we have a gym, we have, uh, you know, pulmonary function test machines, we have AEDs, you know, we, we have all sorts of uh, gadgets and gizmos to help with our patients when they come in. But 99.9% .9 of our patients are all doing their therapy from home, you know, which is great. That's, that's kind of what you want, you know. But I would think results would be better than just convenience. So when you go to your doctor and they're mentioning pulmonary rehab, there is nothing wrong. Because, I mean, for people that don't know, you're the boss. Without patients, a doctor wouldn't be a doctor. A doctor needs patients, right? Clinicians need patients. You know, that's how they, uh, that's how they maintain a job. You know, in their, in their career, that's how they maintain it. Without the patients, there is nothing. So what I'm trying to say is that you're the boss. If, you, if your doctor asks you, all right, I want you to go to a pulmonary rehab, but I want you to choose this, I want you to go to this facility, what's wrong with asking what are the outcomes in that facility? Oh, they're very good. That's not really answering the question I asked. What are the outcomes? What are the average of, what's the average uh, you know, just the average of anybody within a year period, simple question, what's the average of somebody coming off oxygen? Has that data ever been collected? And the doctor says, I don't think so. Okay. Or maybe, yes, that data has been collected. So what's the average? Uh, you know, 10%. Okay, so you write down 10% chance. We're at 98.7%. 98%. 0.7%. We don't work on one or two people. We work at, with thousands of people, you know. All right, then, uh, you at, then the doctor, or you ask also, all right, what is the average of somebody, you know, out of, you know, how many patients have this facility has seen? What's the, what types of therapists they use? Well, they use physical therapists. That's all you need. Well, physical therapist isn't really... You know, no offense to anybody, but I mean, this is this is a fact. I mean, I'm not putting anybody down, but I'm just relaying fact. Physical therapists and nurses don't go into respiratory therapy for four years. Respiratory therapists do that. Who would you rather educate you and work on you when uh, when you know somebody might take only a semester in respiratory care? instead of four years, who would you rather want to help, who would you want to help you? Somebody who is incredibly knowledgeable, incredibly, also is certified, also has a degree, a medical degree, not just any degree, a medical degree in respiratory care. Why wouldn't you want that person looking after your lungs, helping you with technique and therapy techniques and different types of things like that? There was a facility, I'm not going to mention the facility. There was a facility, and um, I knew the, um, the director, and I told the director, would you, would you mind if I pretend to be a patient at your facility? And he said, what do you mean? I said, I'm just curious on what your therapist would do with me, you know, and we'll just make some, you know, some, uh, you know, just, uh, we'll just write down, and we'll make up a fake chart. And it's just a test, you know. And the director was actually, that's actually really interesting. Can we do that? So he checked and saw that we could do that. And what, what I did was uh, there was a camera on me, and everybody was uh, acceptable in this. There was a camera on me, and, I w and everyone's blurred out, you know. But um, I went into this facility, and their, their clinicians were to work on me with walking. And I had to pretend that I could only walk about 50 feet. So when I was in that facility, not one person, not one, not one. They, I mean, like one person asked, you know, one of the physical therapists asked, um, okay, we're going to be walking today. I'm going to see how far you can walk. I said, okay. You know, I got up. I pretended to be labored breathing. There was no, uh, there was no techniques there was no education on what I should be doing, how to walk and breathe, how to control my work of breathing. Even with the respiratory medications that were all placebos, 
uh, we gave fake medications, but the, the clinicians didn't know that over there. They, you know, this was just a test. Most of the, all the time, the whole time, and we, we um, there was a video on it, but it was, uh, actually, I'm going to see if I can find that video. Thank you. There was a video on it, but uh, not one physical therapist. I was looking at all the other patients, and what was funny about it was um, I was disguised. I, I didn't look like myself. I was disguised. But there was these other patients. There are other patients that were having a hard time on their treadmill and another another one on their bike. And I said, "Hey, you know, if you if you take one step and you breathe in, one step you breathe out, just pull in a little bit more air." And I was giving them pointers, and the clinicians were like, "What are you talking? What, what are you saying?" And he says, "Well, I learned, you know, breathing with every walk. You know, I, they didn't know I was a respiratory therapist. You know, they they just think I'm a patient." I said, well, I learned that if you take one step and you breathe in, one step you breathe out, and they're like, that's so interesting. Does it work? And I said, well, yeah, of course it works, you know. And, um, yeah, a lot of people didn't have knowledge on what, type, what things to teach their patients as far as, you know, how to control the work of breathing, how to use talk tests, board scales, um, you know, even the, the basics on stretching, the basics on a lot of different things. And it was just more, more like they just pulled me. Uh, out of a room, they just pulled me out of the, uh, well, actually the waiting room, they pulled me out of the waiting room, and they just had me walk, and that was it. They looked at my oxygen stats, well, your oxygen's really good, and I say, well, you, you can't, you know, you, you can't mess with that, and there wasn't a lot of anything, and um, the director was like, so what did you think at the very end, and at the end, they knew, it, uh, they knew I was a respiratory therapist, but a, a high-level respiratory therapist, uh, uh, therapist, as a lot of people know me. And I said, um, you know, I said, where was the education? I said, there wasn't a lot of education. He said, oh, they, they, they do it sometimes, but uh, you probably have to be in the class to do that. And, and I says, really? Because I mentioned it. And, you know, the director, he was happy, but he was also a little embarrassed that his clinicians, because this was just a spot-on thing to do. It was just spontaneous. And the... The clinicians, you know, I was asking them, why didn't you assess me with my, re you know, respiratory assessment? You know, why didn't you? He said, well, that's not my job description. My job as a physical therapist, I'm just supposed to walk you. You know, I'm supposed to exercise you. I'm supposed to work on lower body occupational, supposed to be uh, working on upper body. And there wasn't a lot of anything. I'm, I'm a, supposedly a person with very advanced lung disease, okay? I don't have lung disease right now, you know, but I'm just saying I'm, pretending to be a patient, I'm supposed to be a person that is middle age, advanced lung disease, uh, oxygen drops very quickly, gets very short of breath very quickly, uh, you know, things like that, that were on my uh, fake diagnosis. And there wasn't any education on my COPD. There wasn't any, it was only one day, but I asked questions. When I'm, I always ask questions. I ask questions, you know, it's like, oh, so what, what is uh, the lung disease I have? Is it bad? And he says, well, that's for your doctor to say. And it was like there was no accountability. It was just kind of, it was just not a great place, I would think, to be at. And the director was like, what, what do you think we should change? I said, the education part of it. And it, it, teaching somebody how to breathe and walk, something that simple. What's so wrong with teaching somebody how to breathe and walk? Breathe and pike, breathe and exercise to show them the right way to breathe, you know. And anyways, um, play, you know, when, when your doctor's asking for you to go into a pulmonary rehab uh, place, there, there is nothing wrong with asking questions, especially, if, especially for outcomes. Does anybody have any questions? Go ahead and write it. I see there's a lot of people watching me right now. You can write in the comment section. Don't be shy. You know, but you can write in the comment section. Okay. Uh, one topic that we come up, that, that uh, comes up quite often is long-term COVID and the pulmonary effects with COVID-19, the long-term long -term COVID. And with long-term COVID, you're looking at lungs that are trying to repair. They're becoming more and more fibrotic. They're, you know, more solidified in a sense. And, uh, you know, somebody's, gonna, somebody's having a hard time with their breathing, of course. So 
our number one go-to before we ever go into anything, our number one go-to is first educating the patient and then, of course, going into the exercises. And what types of exercise do you think would be great for somebody with obstructive lung diseases? Dietary nutrition, what else? Stress management, what else? Tai Chi, yoga, what else? Respiratory muscle training, hyperinflation therapy, bronchial hygiene, coughing techniques, respiratory medication management overview. Also, what else? A lot more. I mean, a lot. You know, when somebody has obstructive lung disease, the problem is the obstruction, right? Meaning, I breathe into some air, I'm only getting rid of half of that. When somebody has restrictive lung disease, they have a hard time inhaling any volume. They just, they, if they have a restrictive lung disease, depending on the severity of the restriction, if somebody's breathing with restrictive lung disease, it's gonna feel, their lungs, their chest is gonna feel tight. It's very hard to breathe. I try to breathe in, doesn't feel like I'm pulling in a lot of air. That's restrictive lung disease. Is there such thing as obstructive and restrictive? Of course, of course there is. And most of the time that's the case. A lot of people have obstructive and restrictive lung disease combined. They have the scarring, they have the obstruction component of it for like from emphysema, you know. And uh, does anybody really know what COPD really is? It's just besides that it sucks because you can't breathe in, <laughs> can't suck in the air. Does anybody know the, the, like what's a good way of understanding what COPD is? You breathe in a gallon, you're only getting rid of half a gallon. That's really all you really want to look at. LLX CBD with SPO2 98. Um, Kelly, you don't have to put your. Kelly, do you understand that there's 30,000 people looking at your data right now? It's not good to. Uh, I'm just saying, it's probably not a good idea to write personal information like that. I mean, it's, I see SPO2 98, I got pulse rate, beats per minute 69, pressure index is 4.7, and respiratory rate's 15. Why do, why do would have, why do would have, oh, I see what you're saying. Why do I have shortness of breath and shaky hands? So what causes out of breath, Kelly? CO2. Why are you looking at your oxygen then? CO2 is not oxygen. What causes out of breath is CO2, not, not the oxygen, right? So we shouldn't be looking at our oxygen for out of breath. It's not really complicated. There's two main gases that come in, and one gas that comes in, one gas that comes out. I mean, Technically, there's a lot more than that just happens, but because you have nitrogen, you have different, you know, uh, different scan amount of um, just, you know, you have nitrogen, helium, xenon gas, you have a lot of different elements, uh, different gases out in the atmosphere. But really what you want to look at is oxygen comes in, CO2 comes out. Okay. Let's say you have carbon monoxide, I bring this up a thousand times, a trillion times maybe. If you have carbon monoxide poison, not carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, CO, not CO2. And it's, uh, does it ever state you're out of breath when you have barely any oxygen in your system? No. So why would anybody think that oxygen is what causes out of breath? My heart has been dropping to 49.55. Ah. So Kelly, th these are questions that are probably not best for our live stream. These are questions for a clinician like me, Kelly, when you're in class. Uh, so let's talk about that really quick. What if we're on a special medication? Okay, Kelly asked, my heart has been dropping to 49 to 55. Okay, 49 to 55. Is there anything really extremely wrong? That's good for an athlete, but a lot of times medications will cause that. How does CO2 from anywhere around your body circulate to, circulate it to your lungs for that CO2 to be breathed out? 
How does it circulate? Your heart does that, right? It pumps, it pumps everything through. It, it keeps circulating throughout your body. So let's say your legs are producing CO2 because you're using them. You're walking. All right, lactic acid, right? That buffers out, turns into CO2. I breathe in oxygen, okay? My muscles are now being, um, are given that oxygen, let's say, okay? And I'm walking, and my muscles consume that oxygen and gives off lactic acid, which turns into CO2 in your body naturally. So your CO2 is starting to climb, all right? How does your CO2 from, that, from your legs circulate to your lungs? Your heart does that. So let's say now you're producing more CO2, but your heart is not going fast enough. What if your heart's not going fast enough? Then you're going to retain it in your system, not talking about in your lungs. You're going to retain it inside your body. I know, Kelly, but I'm... Kelly, that's what I'm, I'm talking about right now. I know you've been walking a lot, but I'm talking about the problem with 49 to 55 beats per minute. Why you feeling out, might be feeling out of breath. Is it due to a medication? If the medication I'm taking is causing my heart not to increase or affecting my heart, how are you supposed to efficiently get rid of CO2? Because you can breathe out as much as you want, but don't think, do not think for a hot second that the CO2 that I'm breathing out right now is coming from my legs. If your heart's not pumping fast enough, how is it, like, let's, look, it's not complicated, guys. Come on. It's not a difficult subject. Everyone thinks this is like rocket science. It's really not. Look, if I'm walking right now, I breathe in air. The CO2 is now being produced from all over my body, wherever I'm using muscles, okay? And even the places that are not being utilized are still needing oxygen and CO2 still being produced. So I'm walking right now. My legs are producing, are bringing in the, are absorbing the oxygen and they're, really, and they're giving off their byproduct, which is CO2. So CO2, let's just say is right here. And my beats per minute is, go, is down. It's not around 80, it's not 70, 80, you know, it's not 60s, you know, it's not 80s, 90s, you know. So the CO2 slowly travel. I'm breathing really fast. <laughs> okay, I'm breathing really fast. Well, the CO2 is still down here. It's not, it didn't make it up here yet. It's too slow. So am I still feeling the work of breathing because the CO2 is still in my body and it's not really being released as quick because my circulatory system is not moving fast enough? Of course. It's not complicated to understand that. So, you know, you have CO2 building up. Look, if I put a end tidal CO2 monitor check, a CAPNA check is what we call it, and I put it in my mouth, it measures how much CO2 is coming out from your body. For those who are wanting to try to buy something like that because they think it's a great idea, let me, uh, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll search next time because I have one here. They're about $2,000 for one small little device that does that. I'm not kidding. A cabinet check? You know, for an Ambu bag, a cabinet check? It's $2,000. Some of them are even higher than that. They're, they're not cheap. You don't need to buy things like that. Those are for hospitals and clinicians to use for multiple people, not for one person. Okay? A good way of looking at your CO2 is looking at your heart rate, but what if the medication you're taking is causing your heart rate to slow down? Well, of course, that's the problem. There's no other problem. That's the problem. Okay? Even if I, uh, let's say we got, uh, you know, your lungs are back to square one. They're back to normal again. Okay? Am I going to still feel work of breathing? Of course you will. Of course. So, Kelly, you're mentioning, so could it be the beta blockers? Yes! I just mentioned the medications. Of course. A beta blocker is literally, that's what it does. It's specifically, that's what it does. That's, that's, what it, that's why doctors prescribe it. There's other reasons, but that's the main reason. So, yes. Of course, if CO2 is having a hard time traveling, and I, anyways, I put a CO2 monitor on me, okay? And I try to breathe really fast like this. Through the CO2 monitor. First, it'll read like probably 48, 45, 
Okay, it'll read 45, which is fine. All right. And if I'm retaining, it'll probably be higher than 45. The normal rate is around 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. So if I start breathing really fast through that end tidal CO2 monitor, well, you breathe through it, and it measures how much CO2 is coming out. If I keep breathing like this really fast, the number, let's say it was 45, will start dropping down, dropping down, dropping down, dropping down, dropping down. Well, and what's happening? I'm hyperventilating. I'm hyperventilating. I'm breathing out like as much CO2 that's coming up to my lungs. But the circulatory system isn't fast enough to draw all the CO2. What happens when I hyperventilate? I pass out. So that means, is CO2 in my body necessary? Of course it is. Of course it is. Of course it is. CO2 in your body is necessary. Somebody said, I want to get rid of all my CO2. I say, so you want to die? You have to maintain a good equilibrium, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, homeostasis, where everything has to maintain the same, you know, homeostasis, it, may, it means homeo, humans, right, stasis, stay as is, stasis, okay, it means temperature has to be good, can't be too high, can't be too low. The nutrition has to be good. It can't be too, like salt can't be too high. Temperature has to be right. Oxygen levels have to be within a certain parameter. Uh, pulse rate has to be a certain parameters. Weight has to be in, within a certain parameters, or else it's looked at as obese, morbid obese, you know, severely morbid, morbid obese, or even malnutrition, meaning I'm so thin. I'm so thin, and I, I, I ha don't have any energy. A lot of people think that, oh, for somebody, let's say, that's, Five foot five. Somebody thinks that if somebody's five foot five and they weigh 120 pounds, they're very underweight. They're very underweight. <laughs> okay? That person's very underweight. And, anyways, so this person's like, I have lung disease. And then you have somebody's like, oh, you got lung disease, so you get out of breath very quickly? Yeah, I, got, I get out of breath very quickly. Well, they're thinking it's specifically their lung disease. that has nothing to do with their weight. I'm pulling in maybe uh, 500 calories, maybe 100 calories, and you don't, have enough cal you don't have enough gas in your system to move because you didn't bring in enough food. So what's happening? Every time you start going, you start huffing and puffing. It's not necessarily your lungs. It could be contributed to that, but it's not necessarily your lungs. It also can mean that you're out of shape. It also means that your muscles are very weak, and a weak muscle takes more energy for it to, you, to be utilized. If, let's say my bicep's very weak, and I'm holding a weight. Let's say my bicep's very weak. If I'm lifting a weight, it's very tough to do, and I'm trying to lift it, lift it, lift it, lift it. Does that take more energy? To lift a heavier weight versus a lighter one, which is easier to do? Of course. It's not rocket science, everybody. You should never be doing pulmonary rehab by yourself without the use of a, a, uh, with a uh, use of a respiratory therapist that's specifically trained in pulmonary rehabilitation. Karen, yes, I understand. I am five foot and weigh 85 pounds. Well, that's the thing is, when somebody's morbidly obese, can they be out of breath because they're just more, they're overweight? Yes! If somebody's way underweight, can they be out of breath because they're, they're just, have no muscle, barely any muscle? Yes! Stop excusing the, uh, the, uh, the lung disease specifically. I, I, I rehab people day in, day out. I, I, I do this every day. I'm rehabilitating people, and I finesse on techniques. I educate myself on new techniques, new things that are happening that other people are trying to find out, and there's not a lot of clinicians that do that. So I have to take it upon myself to learn new different types of variations of different techniques that could actually work and help a, uh, uh, you know, a fellow patient. You know, so I have to obtain this information. What do you think I go to? Do you think I really go to social media? No. What are the chances of... Actually, I don't have the data, so I'll be, I'll be making it up. But what are the percentages from all the medical 
clinicians, so-called medical clinicians, on social media, stating that they're actually clinicians in the United States, licensed and active in the United States. You'd be amazed at the percentage, but I don't have that information. But uh, I, I, I recall it, is, it was something less than 20% of those people were actually licensed clinicians. You know, less than 20. That means 80% of them were not. But I, got, I have to see those numbers, for, uh, but I remember it was less than 20. It was like less than 20 that were actually actual clinicians, you know? The point is, is that you don't ever just go into a gym thinking you know what you're doing, and then you just wind up with, you know, a worse problem because now you're exacerbated something and you injured yourself because you lifted something because you thought it was good for your lungs. There's nothing you're going to lift that's going to be better for your lungs. There's nothing like that that exists. There's no dumbbell that I can lift that's going to benefit my lungs. You're in uh, cardiac rehab? Yes. You know, there, there's nothing that I'm going to lift that's going to do, that's going to benefit my lungs. There's nothing that I'm like if I walk on a treadmill, that's not going to improve my lung functions. It's not going to improve your lung functions. It never improves because you're not working on your lungs. You're using your lungs, but you're not working on your lungs. You're not building muscle in your lungs. If I was building muscles in my lungs, I would never need respiratory muscle training. I would never use a delta V. I would never use anything else. Okay. I would never use anything else. If me breathing right now is all I ever needed to keep my muscles strong, then I wouldn't need an extra weight. If my arm weight itself was enough muscle to keep my biceps big, and I'm a big guy, you know, I can, I can I'll nearly bench a Buick, man. I'm a big guy. I, you know, I'm a very strong person. But if I didn't work out, I would get weaker. I can't rely on my arms to provide the weight, the necessary weight to build muscle, like meaning I'm just going to do this. With no weight in my hands, I'm going to do this, and eventually my muscles grow. What kind of ridiculous thought is that? That's incredibly ridiculous. Because that's not going to happen. You know? That's not going to happen. Can you get tone from that? Of course, maybe. But you need additional weight, you know? Somebody had, in a different location, a different state, which we work throughout the whole United States, somebody in a different state was, like, wanting to walk further, but there wasn't any place to really walk, you know. And I said, where well, is there a track? And he said, yeah, but there's no stairs. There's no nothing I, I can really utilize. I have to travel to go someplace. I said, why don't you just grab a book bag? Put some, like, three or four books that is added up to at least 10 pounds. Put in your book bag and go for a walk in your house. So what do you mean? Well, what are you doing when you add a weight to a book bag? When you put weight on yourself, you're adding, like, uh, and you're basically making up an artificial stairs or a hill, artificial hill. If I'm walking on a flat surface and that's not doing a lot, I add weight to me by putting a book bag that has weight in it, like books, you know, maybe even some regular weights or some water jugs, and I'm going for a walk, I'm adding resistance to my legs. That will be nearly equivalent of going up a hill. Not a very steep hill, but just an incline of a hill or maybe even some stairs. He said, well, I can't do that. Well, well, if you can't, how long could you do it for? Oh, uh, maybe like five minutes. So you can't tell me you can't do it. You just can't go very far with it. Why would you work on something you already can do very well? Makes no sense. You know, or maybe more practice, the better. I, you know, sure, you can go that way if you want to go that route. If I can't walk far because of this added weight to my book bag, then that's what I need to work on. I need to work on things I can't do well. Not just the things I can, but the things I cannot. Anybody have any questions? I'm going to reset this thing really quick. Go ahead, guys. Ask, ask questions as much as you like. Ask questions. Nothing wrong with asking questions. We can talk about, you can bring up medications, you can bring up anything. Uh, we were talking, uh, we we're going to be talking about um, 
uh, COVID-19 and the long-term pulmonary effects. The main thing is that the first COVID-19, as we all should know by now, is more of a respiratory problem. Right? It affects the lungs uh, severely. You know, severely. So the long-term effects. You're, uh, if somebody doesn't work on themselves, they're just exercising on a gym. You're, you're only going to go so far. You're not going to go very far at all because you're not working on the problem. You're working on, okay, the fatigue. You're working on the, uh, the, you know, the muscles for the legs as you walk, but you're not working on the muscles necessary to rehab the lungs. Right? You're not working on that. So what should you do? There's, what, is there anything wrong with asking a respiratory therapist, hey, what should, uh, what should I do as far as walking? What should I do for this? What should I do for that? Foods for gaining weight? Karen, really? That's your question? Why don't you just go with a pizza? <laughs> Who here wouldn't want a pizza right now? Well, you, you, I'm not joking. You need to add calories. I don't care if it's the Krispy Kreme diet. But I am not a dietitian. I've never been a dietitian. I'm a respiratory therapist. But as far as gaining weight, yes, you need higher calories, higher proteins. It's always high calories, high proteins. Okay, high protein, high calories, high proteins. I, uh, you know, a lot of uh, there's people that don't know that I'm also a certified chef. Do you guys know that that I'm a chef? Yeah, went to the London School of uh, of Culinary Arts. And uh, yeah, I'm a chef. I'm a pilot. I have a pilot certification, private pilot certification. I'm an advanced diver. I have an advanced diving certification. You know, I'm a uh, under the uh, AACVPR. There are certifications. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of certifications I have. Even though I know how to make really really good food, doesn't make me a dietitian. Because what does a dietitian do? They look at your weight, look at well, things that you're allergic to, things like what are your there's a I mean, it's a whole different subgroup that is a, it's, 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 a, it's its own category as far as an inter, uh, interdisciplinary team, you know. So th those are necessary in any facility, uh, very necessary, especially for a medical health facility, specifically, you know, that um, handle, like, diabetes and, and uh, uh, malnutrition and stuff like that, so... Uh, questions. Food for weight gains. Um, I mean, food for weight gains. Let's let's pick up. Let's 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 grab. It. Let's talk about some of them. All right. Food to gain weight. Number one. It, the, the, I'm, I don't know if it's the number one top, but number one is potatoes. I uh, I made. Uh, um, I don't know if I, I actually, I have a picture, but I, I won't be good enough to zoom in and everything. But um, I made rice with salmon, a small portion of salmon, and uh, some uh, mussels regonata with, uh, you know, different things. And, I, of course, I had a little bit of mashed potatoes. And I said, this is excellent for your lungs. There was somebody who's like, oh, I don't think that potatoes, mashed potatoes are good for your lungs. I said, who are you, the doctor? No. So why are you butting in? This is good for you. This is very good for you. Well, I don't know. Then why are you chiming in, man? <laughs> there was somebody on, on uh, it was a Facebook. I don't think that's... I went to school for this stuff, man. I know what's good for you, what's not good for you, but I'm not a dietitian. I'm not going to claim to be a dietitian. I am a chef, you know, but I'm not a dietitian. As far as clinical, clinically, I'm a respiratory therapist. I have to know a lot of nutrition. I just, I'm not a dietitian. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with some potatoes. There's, there's such thing as too much of a serving. You know, there is that. Let's see. What do you think about the guy that lived in Iron Lung like 78 years and died of COVID? Really? There was that? I don't, I got to look that up. Actually, I'm going to look that up. He said, 78 years old, and it was an iron lung for 78 years. You know, somebody was like, oh, I wish I, can ha I, wish I had a machine. 
I wish I had a machine that can breathe for me. I says, do you know how idiotic that is? Let's say, <laughs> it's not, it's not, I'm not being mean, but like, you know how, you know how that's not a good idea? You have a machine that's breathing for you. Okay? So, it's doing all the work. Your muscles are not being used. 78 years. Okay? Se let's say 78 years. You weren't even using those muscles. You had a machine. Let's say, let's say there was a machine lifting my arm to lift something up. Okay? Am I using muscle if a machine does the work for me? No. He died last Monday. There's one person, a woman, who's on your lung. They had polio. Well, that's different. Yeah, if it's for specific diseases, our lungs are, you know, it's not really our go-to, but for specific diseases, um, they are beneficial. But you have something that breathes for you. You will not gain respiratory muscles or even the ability to breathe as those muscles get weaker and weaker because you're not utilizing them. You know, the, it's the worst way to live. It's like, yeah, it's called a ventilator. Somebody asked me that. It's like... Can I get a machine that breathes for me? I, I want to just have it breathe for me, and that's it. So you want to be on a ventilator all your life? Wouldn't that be nice? Think about I said, you're right now. I can't even. This person couldn't even sit still. I says, imagine being strapped. Sometimes, yeah. Being strapped to a ventilator or to a bed with a, with a tube in your mouth. Can't talk, can't eat, can't taste food. Can't even breathe in air. It's just the machine's doing everything for you. What kind of quality of life is that? 30, 30 minutes in, you'd be depressed. Talking about years of that. That is incredible. No, that's a horrible idea. Horrible idea. You know? Don't want to allow a machine to breathe for you. You know, a lot of people uh, think that, oh, or the non-invasive ventilators like uh, BiPAPs and CPAPs, once you're diagnosed with sleep apnea, you know, and you can't get re your lungs can't get rehabilitated. Well, what what if the, what's causing the sleep apnea is the over excessive weight and you reduced weight? What is what if also what's causing the sleep apnea is not just the excessive weight, but the muscles are not strong enough to ventilate on its own throughout the night? And what happens if you strengthen them up? then how can you not get off a of CPAP and BiPAP? I don't know where these doctors are coming up with their answers, but I'm really fed up with a lot of these bad doctors. I really am. I, I am. There's a lot of bad, there's a lot of great doctors, but there are a lot of bad ones. A lot of them are just burnt out. I'm not being mean. I'm, I'm just, I'm telling you facts. You know, they're just burnt out. I was on it for two weeks. No, it's not a life. I mean, it's the worst life you could ever think of. It's not a great life. Being Imagine. I mean, if anybody have claustrophobia, I have some cla I don't have an extreme amount of claustrophobia, but I have some claustrophobia. I don't like really extremely, like if there's a lot of people around me, I don't like that. I don't, I'll actually, it's a fight or flight response on me, and I'll just most likely walk away and go to a different area that uh, there's not, ton of people around me. I just don't like a large groups of people like that. Like surrounding me, you know? Why do you think this thing is virtual? <laughs> Why do you think our pulmonary rehab program is virtual? Be other people have social pro like they have social fears. You know, they have fear to be around people, they have fear for nosocomial infections. You go into a facility and most of the people there are sick. Most of the people there have a disease or else they couldn't be admitted into that facility. And now you, have an, you are immunocompromised because you have a lung disease or you have a heart disease, and you go in there and you catch what they just got that, that wound them up in a ventilator or, you know, with a heart attack or with this or with that. And now you got it. You have to go through everything that person just went through. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, oh, my goodness. I was hospitalized with respiratory failure and hypoxemia and a hyper, uh, see, hyperopnea, I mean, a hypercapnia. 
Also had pseudomonas, pseudomonas, respiratory infections. Now on oxygen, never been before. Is there any hope of getting off oxygen? Do we, did everyone just come in late or something? Did it, Glenda, did you come in late or something? Is there any hope? I, I guess in a, it's okay. I mean, maybe you just don't know. Um, Glenda, uh, Bushman, you came in late? Okay. There hasn't been anybody who's on oxygen can come off of oxygen as long as their heart's not compromised. You have to be weaned off. You don't do it yourself. There's no hope in it. It's either you do it or you don't. You stop looking at hope. Like there's a sp special thing that's going to happen. It's work. That's what therapy is. It's not a magic wand. There's no hope in it. It's either you do it or you don't. Of course you'll come off oxygen. Of course you'll increase your lung functions. Of course you'll walk further. That's what you're in a program for. That's what you would go into a pulmonary rehab program for. Unless the pulmonary rehab program you went to or the cardiac rehab program you went to didn't do anything besides just exercise you. If that's all they did and they didn't educate you, they didn't do anything else, that, sorry, it's not a, that's just as good as a regular gym. You know, you'll get some help, but you won't get a lot of help for your respiratory illness or your heart. They're just exercising you. So where are the techniques? So, of course, there's more than just hope, Glenda. There is a lot more than just hope. This is what we do every day. We wean people off oxygen, but we have to increase their lung functions. And to do that, we use respiratory muscle training. But you have to be in a rehab program because we have to give the proper data to your doctor so the doctor can sign you off that you don't need oxygen anymore. You can't just be at home and say, hey, doc, I don't need oxygen anymore. And the doctor will be like, oh, okay, you know more than me. Nope, they're not going to do that. They're not going to say yes to that. They want a clinician to oversee it. They need a clinician to oversee it. There's no such thing as hope in that. It's either you do it or you don't. It's like, I hope I can walk to that location. Well, get up and walk. Well, I can't. All right, well, let's exercise the leg so you can. There's your fix. It's not, it's not tough to rehabilitate somebody, you know. I'm not sure where a lot of people are getting the uh, information from, but they're pulmonologists. Doctors don't do pulmonary rehab. They're not in pulmonary rehab. They oversee it. They don't work in pulmonary rehab. A doctor in pulmonary rehab? That's not going to happen, okay? That's not going to happen. There's no doctor that works as a pulmonary, uh, as, a res as a respiratory therapist, as a, as a practitioner in rehab that does an exercise with the patient. I don't know any doctor that does that. Like MD doctor, not PhD doctor. MD. So you're asking a doctor, what's a good pulmonary rehab? They'll say, oh, go to this facility. Well, how good is that facility? Uh, I don't know. I sent a lot of people there. That still doesn't answer my question, and I don't believe that's the answer to the question I asked. How good is it? Out of 100 people, how many people weaned off oxygen with that facility? I don't know how to have that answer. Okay, well, then why would I want to come off oxygen? I don't want to join a rehab program unless I can. Let's say that was the person's mentality. I don't want to get off of that unless I can, you know. I want to be able to walk at least 200, you know, 300 a mile without stopping. I want to increase the lung functions. That's what I want, Doc. I want my life back. Well, let's see what they can do. But can you almost, almost guarantee me 98.7% HRN? 98.7, that. 98.7%. Do you know what this logo is? Does anybody know what this logo is? This is a camera lens. This is a person in the camera lens, and the green is uh, green and blue backgrounds are for like green screens. Yeah, because most of our therapy is done through a camera. You know, so when I see the patient, patient sees me right here, like like I am sitting, 
and I'll get to see and hear the patient just like if the patient was directly in front of me. And, uh, but, I mean, that's, that's what a virtual program does. But your doctor, once you put you in a rehab program, what do you want to gain from it? That's really what the questions are. And then you, you discuss that with your doctor. Hey, doc, I want to come off oxygen. I want to increase my lung functions. I want to be able to this, this, then, and this. Uh, that's what I want to be able to do. I'm not sure if I can get all of them done, but I want to try to at least get most of them all done. I want to benefit more. I don't want to be on oxygen anymore. Doctor says... Oh, uh, I don't, well, you know, I have lung disease, it's not, re, it's not reversible. But I can get an increase in lung functions. Well, a good doctor would, uh, that is knowledgeable would say, yes, there is an increase in lung functions that you do when you're doing respiratory muscle training. A knowledgeable doctor would say that. A unknowledgeable doctor was like, I don't know about that. Don't go to that doctor. Don't ask that doctor any more questions. All right, I... Uh, I want to join a program that does at least a 98% on my goals. That can hit my goals 98.7% of the time. Which place is that? Well, HRN does that. Oh, the virtual program. Okay, I'll send you to the virtual program. All right, there you go. Done. It's not complicated. Just asking simple questions to your doctor. And if your doctor is saying, I want you to go to this facility, just easily ask. This is for you. This is not for me. This is for you. Simply ask a simple, basic question. Uh, hey, Doc, I want to come off oxygen. I want to be able to walk further, like at least a mile without stopping. I want to strengthen up my limbs. I want my lung functions to increase. And, uh, you know, and you write down this list. I want these goals to be accomplished. Like, well... What is it, Diane Pierce? I told my doctor my heart was too fast while resting. Instead, I'm finding out why I get a pill. <laughs> and there's no medication to fix it. You know, there are medications to slow your heart, to maybe even increase your heart rate. There's, uh, there's medications for a lot of different reasons, but there is no medication to increase muscle mass, to increase lung functions. There is none. I don't know why everyone keeps trying to search for this thing. There is nothing out there. If there was something out there, I would have re already related to you. We would be using it here. There is no magic pill to fix you. There is none. Nothing like that exists. Well, in this other country, they say they have this thing I put underneath my tongue. I put two drops in my tongue and it replaces my lungs. It fixes my lung back to brand new. Good luck to you. But that information is obviously falsified. Well, how could you say that? I, I, these are questions that I get asked a lot. How could you say that? Show me the peer review. Show me the study. Show me the FDA study. Oh, they didn't have one. So this is not FDA approved. Now how do I know it's safe for my patients? What if my patient is allergic to one of those ingredients in there? Well, it doesn't mention that. So how could you tell me that this does that? Show me evidence that it does work at least. Well, here, it was a quick video. That's an animation video. They showed me an animation video of a very, very diseased lung with end stage upon end stage of lung disease, and the lungs look black and tarred up from all the cigarette smoke. And you put two drops <laughs> on your tongue, underneath your tongue, and you wait 30 minutes. 30 minutes, guys. You wait 30 minutes. And then magically, these two drops... Fix your lungs, and your lung functions are back up to past 100%. You're off of oxygen. You don't need to exercise because those two magic drops did that. Well, I did say maybe a little more than two drops. Are you insane? Where is your brain at? What pill is this? There's no peer review. There's no studies done. There's nothing that shows that this works. You have an animated video... And I can easily do an animation right now. You guys want to see? Look at that. Look, simple animation. I can make an animated video. Look at this, look. Here's a quick animation. I have a smiley face. I have a frowny face. Whoop, whoop. That's animation. It's just it's pages, pages of art just overlapped with each other, and they kind of sink in and form motion. You know, 
You can't tell me animation is replacing an anatomical body, and that's your proof. It shows it on the animation. <laughs> I said, you can, you can make, what are you, that's not a proof. That's not living tissue. That's electronic. That's a computer animated video. Well, they sell it. I don't know what you want me to do about it. I can't fix everyone's problems and everyone's mistakes. You know, what I can do is rehabilitate somebody's lung. Anyways, let's move forward. Anybody, I told my doctor my heart rate was fast. Yeah, I already, uh, mentioned that. Does anybody have any other questions? We're going to go into our topics and things, but if anybody has questions to ask, please write in the comment section. I'm, I'm going to look at it right now. Go ahead and write anything you want in the comment section. But uh, anyways, for pulmonary rehabilitation, we work with people Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, and it's in a group setting. It's not large groups, but it's in a group setting. It's preferred a group setting. And the outcomes are so much better. But anyways, it's in a group setting. You're at home. You stay at home, and you do the workouts through your computer or through your camera. Uh, and we send you the equipment if you don't have the equipment. But, um, but yeah, you do it Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's usual. Uh, we're covered by Medicare and a lot of commercial insurances. You know, but specifically Medicare, all the other commercial insurances usually follow along with Medicare anyways. So uh, you work out Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You pick the times. And uh, usually they're about an hour and a half each, hour and a half, that's 90 minutes. So they work out Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and they just in a group, and they keep go doing it until we get the results we want. If the results, which are based off of the patient's goals, is to wean off oxygen, then we won't stop until the oxygen is weaned off. But we don't have all the time in the world to do it. We only have three months to get you to that point, you know. Worst case scenario, we could extend it to an additional three months, but most of the time it's three months. So it's, it's not like we're going to try and try and, you know, let's say we try, we, didn't, we weren't successful, we weren't successful, we weren't successful, we weren't successful. At the end of the three months, we wouldn't be successful. We couldn't hold a 98.7% success rate if, somebody was, if all those people were failing. We pat, we, we're at 98.7% successful. We're the highest in the United States. Is there a new Delta V out? There isn't a new Delta V out yet. The Delta Vs are the blue ones. There is a secondary one being made, but um, to rehabilitate somebody, you just use that. We, we use that all the time to rehabilitate somebody. The new one just has different features to it. So it's called the Delta V2, but, uh, but that's pretty much it. Anything else, anybody? That's it. All right, guys. Well, that's all the time I have today. If no one has, wants, uh, wants to ask any other questions, uh, you're very welcome. If anybody wants to ask any other questions, please don't hesitate to ask questions. But um, I'll, for my class, I'll see you guys in class. See you guys. Bye-bye. I'm going to go do some, some other work here. <laughs>